Funding for the production of Public Square provided by the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, working to improve the lives of vulnerable children. My children in elementary school were getting rewarded with candy and all the school parties. The focus was on cakes and cupcakes and, and that's the norm. There are APS schools that are pushing 40% of kids that are obese and that's not even including kids that are overweight. We have little children that are on high blood pressure medications and that is just not right. The senator and I both remember the days that we had to do 100 sit-ups. You know, it was a challenge back then. In San Felipe, we built a soccer field and a community park with a walking trail. It was the first recreational facility in that Pueblo's history. What we've lost, I think, is really valuing food, knowing where food comes from. Families don't cook. I mean, most families just don't cook at all anymore. You know, at the end of the day, none of these people can afford healthy food. Somehow we should be able to get across the point that a bag of black beans that would serve a whole meal for $1.30 is more economical than the dollar a piece, dollar menu items at a fast food store. The risk is far greater for Native Americans, for Hispanics, for African American kids, and we are letting those kids down if we don't make the policy changes. It took us a long time to get here. It's going to take us a long time to reverse the trend. Welcome to Public Square, where civic dialogue takes center stage where real people come together with leaders to discuss and help solve important community issues. Imagine if you have a kindergartner who is obese, what are their chances of reversing that? And then what's incredibly scary is from thir at third grade, they almost double it. We're seeing 22% of third graders who are obese. Today we'll be talking about something that is a worry in every community, how heavy our kids are getting. In New Mexico, we are facing an epidemic of childhood obesity. So today we've invited a group of people who have experience with this issue. They are educators, parents, healthcare workers, cooking teachers, and advocates. After we talk to them for a while about the nature of this problem, we'll bring in State Senator Cisco McSorley, State Representative James Smith, and Patty Morris from the New Mexico Department of Health, and we'll talk about solutions. But before we get started, Here's a little bit more about our topic. I put my salsa on top. Don't be afraid to try it. This looks broken, but it tastes good. <laughs> Childhood obesity has more than tripled over the last 30 years, and studies show the problem takes root in elementary school, where childhood obesity rates rise steeply. For example, in New Mexico, 13% of incoming kindergartners, 25% of Native American kindergartners, and 22% of third graders are obese. And young people who are very overweight or obese often develop health problems that we used to only see among adults, like heart disease, diabetes, cancer, and arthritis. Experts say there are several things young people should do. Eat smaller portions, get more exercise, limit time with TV and computers, have fewer sugary drinks, and eat more fruits and vegetables. Every parent knows that getting kids to eat more fruits and vegetables can feel like an impossible task. But one program in Santa Fe is finding success in getting kids to cook and eat healthy food. At Chaparral Elementary, second graders in the Cooking with Kids program are learning skills that their parents and teachers hope will last a lifetime. I'm Miss Kathy, we've met before. Today we have a little menu here for you. Look at the front of your book. It says, black bean tostadas with salsa fresca. That's what we're cooking today. This cooking lesson is full of second grade curriculum. They're learning how to read the recipe. They're doing math with the measurement. Um, right now they're doing some geography, learning about where the food is from, and even some history of how the food came to the United States. They're having so much fun and it's so hands-on that they're not realizing that it's a learning experience for them, but it is. They're learning things that won't be on any standardized tests, but their teacher, Kelly Griego, says they're picking up valuable life skills. 
Healthy weight is something that I worry about because I see not only the unhealthy food choices are being made by families and by children, but also they're not getting out, they're not running enough, they're indoors playing video games or watching television, and they need to be more active. It's important for them to recognize the difference between healthy food and non-healthy food because they're building those habits now. They'll build upon it as they grow older and make healthy choices throughout their life. We said we're visiting the country of Mexico, right? Because a lot of this food started there and this recipes are from there. In the United States, we would say dinner is served. In Mexico, they would say la cena está servida. Let's say that. La cena está servida. Now guess what? You may taste the food you've worked so hard to make. The healthy food isn't always appealing to them because it doesn't come with all those bells and whistles. They're drawn into the packaging, the, um, the characters on the boxes, the toys that are sometimes included. The healthy foods aren't always packaged um, in that manner. They're packaged by nature. Over time, the cooking classes make a change in the kids' behavior. In my classroom, they're starting to notice when a snack is healthy, when it's not healthy. They're beginning to tell me instead of me telling them. Ray Suarez came to volunteer for cooking class, hoping his grandson will learn some habits that will keep him healthy as he grows older. The reason I'm here is because of my grandson, and I love it. Me, I'm diabetic, so I don't eat out because all the foods out in the restaurants, they're all processed foods. So I do a lot of cooking, even now that I'm retired, and anything you cook at home is a lot better than it is at the restaurants. And if they learn that, while, well, like you said, obesity would be down, they do their own cooking, it's better food all around. It was like really all the things that describe delicious combined. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> We've lost the ability to take care of ourselves. Our priorities have shifted, and we don't see the value of time together as a family, time together being active, that our health should be a priority and come up here above work and other chores and things that we do. Over a generation, our families have changed how they eat and communities have, and so we see that as the normal. Right now, about 30% of kids in Albuquerque are obese, so it's not something unusual that we see. And these kids have um, issues with self-esteem, they have trouble with school, um, they're at much higher risk for being picked on and bullied at school, um, and that's just, it's heartbreaking to see. We do what we were taught, and if our parents weren't taught how to eat well, how to be active, how to turn off the TV, that type of thing, then we do what they did. And here's what I fear. I fear instead of having people on dialysis when they're in their 60s or 70s, we're going to start having people on dialysis from obesity when they're in their 30s. So we're now looking at losing a lot of our young leaders in their prime, and those are the ones that keep our language and our traditions alive. So we're really, truly talking about the survival of American Indian nations. There is a huge connection between poverty and obesity. And what we find is families buying a bag of potatoes that will last um, two or three days, and their main meal is fried potatoes. Although people are often confused about why um, poor people are obese, um, there are really strong, very logical connections. I tell my kids that doctors used to smoke in their exam rooms. They don't believe me. I want the kindergartners of tomorrow to not to be completely disbelieving that there was ever soda or pizza at school. If you're looking to save money and prevent health consequences, preventing this is really the best way to do that. And it starts with kids. I mean, that's really the easiest way. I want to start with you, Carolyn. You've been seeing patients, little patients, for 30 years now. So you've got a nice perspective on this issue. Tell us what has changed in your practice over 30 years. Well, I will tell you that the biggest uh, surprise to me when I went into pediatrics is that I started seeing children and treating them for high blood pressure. And so there are many reasons that children can have high blood pressure, but what I was encountering was children who were having high blood pressure, not because of some disastrous kidney disease, but simply because they were obese. We have little children that are on high blood pressure medications. And that is just not right. I grew up in the, in the 70s, so early 70s, 
mid 70s we were doing like 20 some pull-ups on the physical fitness test and when I was doing my cooperating teaching I did Ernie Pyle Middle School, Barcelona Elementary, Cleveland Middle School, Harrison Middle School and uh, six to eight was like the stud <laughs> in class and, and uh, it's funny but it's not because this is 1991 when that occurred. So imagine what it is now. I'm afraid to even know. I'm currently working on a, a garden project at Barcelona Elementary, and we selected that school because it has one of the highest rates of childhood obesity among APS schools. And uh, there are APS schools that are pushing 40% of kids that are obese, and that's not even including kids that are overweight. It really limits their uh, you know, mobility and uh, ability to participate and kind of fun daily things. But are the vending machines still there? I don't know if the vending machines are still there. It's <laughs> a very good question. Actually, they better not be. <laughs> I haven't seen any. Well, their yeah, their vending machines are there. They're right, they're, um, limited. they're limited. They're supposedly to when they can access the machines and what's actually in the machines. But um, I could say probably that there are plenty of schools that still have pretty high fat, pretty high sugar content in the vending machines and um, I'm a parent of two APS children and my children in elementary school were getting rewarded with candy and all the school parties the focus was on cakes and cupcakes and and that's the norm the exception are the fruits and the vegetables and I'd really like to reverse that um, but implementing that is very difficult um, people do not want you taking their cupcakes away <laughs> You know, we, we had a very, uh, Governor Richardson passed, uh, pushed through a very aggressive policy for school in, in uh, foods in school. How, how's that going? What are you guys seeing? Well, that got passed in 2006, and New Mexico was the second state in the nation to actually pass that, and some of us that are in this room actually worked on that. Um, and it was to actually curtail um, what we see in the vending machines and try and find some healthier options, as well as actually... It was supposed to curtail some of the cupcakes as well. What's interesting is that was 2006, five, well, four years later, child nutrition reauthorization at the federal level really ramped that up. That was a year ago. So we'll have higher nutrition standards, but there was a pushback by Congress who actually made those rules. And, um, and so we'll see how it all comes out. But the pushback came by, by lobbyists, um, who were focused on the potatoes that were on the plate, the french fries, and the pizza, and hoping that what ended up on the pizza would be considered a vegetable. So the good news is, is that we're seeing more fresh fruits and vegetables. It's supposed to put more fresh fruits and vegetables on those plates. And we're doing a lot of that here in New Mexico, even with New Mexico grown produce. So You can't package fruit and let it stay in a machine. <laughs> The shelf life of fresh fruits and veggies is just not there as compared to those kind of packages. The other thing, it takes time to adjust your taste buds. Give it three weeks trying something. Kids are used to eating the vending machines, and so the fresh fruits and vegetables don't have the taste appeal. Initially, they haven't tried it long enough for them to choose those first. Do apples not come in flaming Hot? <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, Flamin' Hot Cheetos Flamin is like hot the, state, the state. It is a staple to see. Um, <coughs> there was a wonderful article I, I once read uh, by a pediatrician in California, and the title of the article was No Come Nada, and that means you don't eat anything. And it's because yeah. you would get parents that would come in and they say, my child isn't eating. No come nada. Aeon, no come nada. And, and what they were saying, they were saying that at the same time that the child had the hot Cheetos, and the soda. Um, and what they were saying is, if I don't give them that, they won't eat anything. It takes time for kids to, um, to like a new food. It's not just, well, he won't eat it, but you have to keep trying with them, keep working with them, and remove the ones Right. So that they're not filling up. Well, I right. think it's so much about it's an access issue because hot Cheetos are rampant through Native American communities as a major food source. My daughter happens to love them. Um, but really, when we look at the average tribal community here in the state of New Mexico, it's a food desert. And so it's, you know, you're the only food source on the reservation. It's typically going to be a convenience store. Um, but also looking at the issue of economics around healthy food as well, and that it becomes very easy when you need to feed your family or to feed your child to look and go spend 99 cents on a bag of hot Cheetos or, you know, a pop in order to provide some kind of nutrition. And I think 
you know, we look at that issue of food access and really looking at the fact that I think unhealthy eating habits are being institutionalized in our schools, just despite what legislation is really going on. Um, so that now here in New Mexico, at least 51% of all Pueblo children are overweight or obese. And many of them are getting a big source of their calories at school. And that's part of the concern, I think, that all of us have in this group is, is certainly the rates of obesity in, in all of New Mexico and APS system. But for minority children, she's at, Crystal is absolutely right, the risk is far greater, far greater for Native Americans, far greater for Hispanics, far greater for African American kids. And we are letting those kids down if we don't make the policy changes and the changes that need to be made so that these kids aren't getting those secondary health effects. Well, so really, you know, and with regard to Native American children, statistics now say that one out of two children born after the year 2000 will develop type 2 diabetes. And in terms of African American and also Hispanic, those populations are right there. And so we have a huge epidemic on our hands that's, you know, children as young as four now are being diagnosed with type 2. Um, and really looking at overall, the World Health Organization came out with a study saying that emerging nations, which tribal nations would fall under, by 2025 will be spending at least 40% of their annual budgets on diabetes care. Mm -hmm. And here in the United States, they're predicting by 2025 that the United States government will spend probably over 20% of its annual budget. So whether you look at the economics or as we look at its parents, um, for Native Americans, it's really about the survival of our communities. You know, this is an issue that we all need to come together, and that's why this is such an interesting it, forum. It's also a health justice yeah. issue, and I think your organization really speaks to that. Well, I mean, what we found, I mean, it's really an economic justice issue. I was saying earlier that we're doing our second short film on, on hunger, basically, and this is a, on summer food, and so we went out to Gallup, and what we saw were people who had full-time jobs. Uh, one woman worked at Applebee's full-time, um, and they have a real problem putting healthy food on their plate. The, another family, the mother worked at Walmart um, full-time for 16 years in the finance department, lived in a trailer. Her kids did summer food. They were poor enough to, to, be, to be participating in summer food. And there is you know, at the end of the day, none of these people can afford healthy food. And even the gas to get, when you're on the reservation, the gas to go buy the groceries, you look back to all of it, it's a lot of just economic justice issues and making sure people have paid a livable wage so that they can go buy fresh fruits and vegetables instead of that bag of potatoes that they fry up and eat for three days. Um, I want to jump in and go back to the trying to get kids to eat something besides a flaming Hot Cheeto. Yeah. <laughs> I think it starts with what the mother is, can eat during her pregnancy. You know, there are studies that show that uh, it does affect the taste buds of the child. Um, and what you offer your child to begin with, considering if you have the option to offer fruits and vegetables. I think um, there's probably a lot of parents at home who are going, <coughs> no freaking way. The kid will not eat kale. No way. But Lynn, we have with us an expert, a magician who has actually witnessed children eating kale. How does this work? If children prepare food of all different kinds, and then if they have the choice to eat it, they are much more likely to do so. Because food can be one of those few issues, really, or realms where children have power. They can say, I'm only eating Flamin' Hot Cheetos. Right. Mm -hmm. But if they actually prepare it, what I've seen is for the most part, children after once or twice will really be interested in eating it. Is that what we have kind of stopped doing, is having kids help in the kitchen? Does that make a big difference? I think it really does make a big difference. And we're now almost at the second generation of mothers primarily, but adults you know, fathers too, for the most part not cooking. What we've lost, I think, is really valuing food, knowing where food comes from, having the experience of having a garden, not that everyone is going to be a farmer, but, ha you know, having that excitement of planting something and pulling a carrot out of the ground or digging for potatoes, you know, it's really, really fun. And cooking is the same kind of thing. We're almost at the place where we think if it's fun, it's not good. <laughs> and I, don't that's I, don't, I don't think it's an issue of kids not helping in the kitchen. I just want to reiterate what Lynn said. Families don't cook. I mean, most families just don't cook at all anymore. Um, and it is, you completely lose that investment in what food is. Um, 
I don't think kids can recognize food. Yeah. You can go into most supermarkets, whether you know it's Walmart mm -hmm. or um, local supermarkets, and the entire middle section of the supermarket, there's nothing recognizable as food. It's pre-made packaging. I was going to ask you, does in you know, does getting them invested in growing the food and seeing it growing, does that make them more willing to try something like a beet? Oh, I mean, I've seen third graders like argue over who gets to try the broccoli, and that doesn't happen in a kitchen. Yeah. You know, I mean, it doesn't happen in a grocery store for sure. You know, they're not reaching for the fresh vegetables, and it, I think. Uh, it's just sort of human nature. If you're invested in something and work towards uh, growing something or producing something, I mean, you want to benefit from, from your work. I think um, there's also a potential in the grocery store. In our program, we actually have a grocery store tour and we take the kids. And when one family came back and talked to us, their 10 and 12 year old were going to them and they were pulling down, reading the label and said, no mom, we can't get this. So I, I value the growing and the garden, and that I think that's great. But let's not forget to take our kids to the grocery store, know how to read labels, and get them invested in what goes into the shopping cart to begin with. Because and, the, and the planning as well, because it's, it's great when you say, I'm, um, I've been a working mother all my life, and uh, I can tell you that when I have to work late and get home, and it's a lot easier to reach for that prepackaged, add the meat, and you're good to go instead of trying to plan out, you know, boy, I'm getting home late. We were just talking about this. Um, you were just talking about your daughter and you've got to feed your daughter tonight. So you're thinking, what am I going to feed her? And, you know, so having that preparation, the same thing for lunches when you pack lunches with kids, is having them involved, preparing it, thinking ahead of the week. What can I do to get things ready maybe on the weekend so that I'm not reaching for that prepackaged food? At the last minute anymore. You mean plan? Do a menu? <laughs> I'd love to see Victory Gardens mm -hmm. come back, you know, where every family had a small or a community garden. Not every family is going to be able to have a garden, and I mean, there certainly are time constraints, but I, a lot of it, I think, is exposing kids at an early age. So they're a uh, they're used to it. They they know what a vegetable is, where it comes from, <laughs> yeah. and no, that's a big problem. Yeah. And I I do also want to make the point: it's not entirely accidental that we find ourselves in this situation. I mean, the government um, subsidizes you know corn and soybeans uh, to an enormous degree in this country, and we end up with a, a glut of grains that we need to figure out something to do. So you get a lot of cheap meat and high fructose corn syrup, and you know both of those are associated with obesity. So some of this, there's a farm bill coming up for renegotiation in Congress um, this coming year. I mean, that's billions of dollars. And if you, I mean, it's, it's a big issue, but if you can change the structure of subsidies in this country, I think you're going to get less of the stuff that makes people unhealthy and more of the stuff that you want people eating. I think Nate's right. We're seeing the shift already in the farm bill. For us in New Mexico, we're really lucky because actually we don't have too many of the commodity programs. Um, but they're, they're little gems. There's one that came out of the recent Child Nutrition Reauthorization Act called um, Farm to School. And it will provide for things like putting in a garden and doing, like Lynn's doing, nutrition education, which just makes all the sense in the world to put all those pieces together. So you're right, Nate. I mean, we've, we are on a great turn now. And so I think this is a real time for us to continue to be focused on, on food as an issue and on obesity as the challenge, um, but I think we have every opportunity to uh, make change happen. Let's talk about something that's not changing very fast, the actual school lunch. Who has seen a, a school lunch recently? It is a really interesting issue because on one hand, we, well, we have all these kids who are relying on school meals more than ever. Um, uh, Iowa State University just came up with this very interesting, rigorous study that showed that if you look at children eligible for free meals, the children that, that got school meals had healthier indicators in terms of obesity than the children who also eligible for free meals brought their own meals, which makes sense because probably what those kids are bringing are chips and soda and, and, and despite the, you know, uh, mystery meat aspect of some of the lunches, <laughs> it actually is somewhat balanced. It did provide mm -hmm. something. 
Um, you get a lot of pushback that I'm sure um, you know Pam and ha has dealt with when you're trying to kind of promote a healthier meal from the student nutrition director. We really love these kids, but um, a they are worried that if you serve something healthier, they won't the kids won't eat yeah, it and it they will lose their the money and it goes in the garbage. Um, and b that they have this very limited budget um, within which they have to pr produce their meal. Should we expect that schools could do some of these same strategies that we're telling ourselves we have to do? You know, introduce the kale, allow mm -hmm. them to choose. So Revolution Foods, which is a, a business, um, had come and went to many different states, and I think they tried to come here, and I think it hasn't worked out. But um, and they do these taste tests. They try and get them to do these food taste tests, and eventually the kids uh, actually eat it. I mean, the problem is they've never really been able to get down within the the school lunch budget, the reimbursement budget, yeah. um, to, yeah. to produce the same thing. And that is really ultimately the, the one of the problems. We all want to jump on those, that poor school lunch, but it, I don't think that the people that are involved in making it, these people care. These people have kids. Their kids go to these schools. They, they're from the community. And that is, is a big mistake when we don't involve the community. And we don't go to the people that work in that community mm -hmm. and say, how can we work with you? to make this better. Mm -hmm. Because it's not like they're trying, they're not they trying. And they, they're invested, resources. they're invested, and they have limited yeah. resources. School meals are really a perfect reflection of our food system. We have $2.70 and some cents for reimbursement for a full, you know, free lunch. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Now, if you're a magician, you could do something fabulous with that. But given our food system, it's kind of, there's, there are many impediments. We've done a lot of work with school meals and actually our recipes that children cook in the classroom and take home are also designed for school, school meals and served in Santa Fe Public Schools several times a month. But it is a systemic social value issue and it is also a food justice issue. It really is and I don't think we can ignore that. I have this kind of dream that if we valued these people who are cooking for our children every day as we value chefs, what could be accomplished? I, and I, mm -hmm. that's what I'm talking about. That's what mm -hmm. I absolutely agree. Mm -hmm. and, and that's just not well, I don't know how many people are really saying that, though. I mean, mm -hmm. I think that's part of it is um, I think it's a small group of people that are being advocates around what's going on with mm -hmm. school lunches or different things, but really what I think the revolution where it's going to start is around that dinner table. Mm -hmm. And it's really about education because I think there's a lot of wonderful people out there providing those meals that don't just don't know better. Mm -hmm. And we see it constantly with parents. Like they don't understand that, you know, handing the pop over to their three-year-old, you know, or handing the bag of hot Cheetos over is a bad thing. I mean, these are snacks and, you, you know, you, there's nothing malicious there. But I think it's really around education around parents. I think there's more education in schools that needs to go on with teachers um, because for example at my daughter's school at testing last year every child received breakfast as the incentive for testing and they gave them a donut <laughs> sausage and scrambled eggs and a big old glass of juice before they went in for testing and I'm like well, you know I mean so I think it I don't think there's anything I don't think they did that with intention to do something bad I just think that we have a lot of education to do and that we need to also I think I think as parents sometimes need to stop whining around that, oh, we're being victimized by various systems. We really have a choice about what we are choosing our, to feed our children with to some extent. And now, the, the, you know, we do have our communities that have less options because of the whole issue around economics, around access to healthy foods. But, you know, still, if we have some basic education in place, I think that we can also help to make better cho choices for our children. Right. As a group, let's brainstorm a small handful of things that you think have to be changed right away. I think access, you know, equitable access is really important so people do have choices. And, and I agree about education as well. Somehow we should be able to get across the point that a bag of black beans that would serve a whole meal for a dollar thirty is more economical than the dollar a piece, dollar menu items at a fast food store. We have 11 school districts that are purchasing New Mexico grown fresh fruits and vegetables. And that's about a half a million dollars of sales right now to farmers. And so we are getting local produce on the tables. And much of it is about changing how we do things. So, and that's been a change that we've been working on for 10 years. So it's exciting to see new things happening. A continuing theme that I, I hear from all of this discussion is really a partnership. I don't think that there is one absolute magic bullet that's going to solve the problem off the top of my head as far as um, 
for for school systems, um, a minimum amount of recess time for sure. There are some school, I mean, there there is a PED level that says thir 30 minutes a day, but I think that nobody's really following that. I know there's a elementary school in APS, their kindergartners do not get recess till after one in the afternoon. So I think just some really basic, more physical activity at school, brain breaks, um, more fruits and vegetables at school, so move more, eat more fruits and vegetables, have access to water at schools. Um, also, uh, my kids brought lunch, but they wanted to buy milk, but they didn't want to stand in the line to get milk. They couldn't, they, they didn't make a separate milk line. So I think, you know, there's some very fundamental things that can happen quickly within schools that will bring up the health of the school show that you value healthy food by paying for it. And I talked a little bit about government subsidies, but um, you know, in the long run, the costs associated with a poor diet are much higher than the upfront cost mm -hmm. of paying for healthy food. They so. just don't see it. Cause it's right. Not right. They don't see it. See this, a lot of this is about an honest eco economic discussion about what, you know, it's like with the competitive foods in schools. Well, if you want your cheerleaders to be able to sell pizza and brownies on Fridays, that takes this much money away from from the school food service, you know, the, the, the french fries now are, this is what it's costing us later. I mean, it is a matter of economics, a lot of it. I mean, what, at Appleseed, we call it doing the um, right thing for the wrong reasons. Um, you know, a lot of times it's about finding the right, the, the, even if it's the wrong reason, an economic reason um, to do the right thing. Right. Preventative medicine was around in the 70s, and we're still trying to, for, you know, get people to buy into it. I mean, what do we not get about that? <laughs> let's, you know? let's take a little break now and come back and talk about solutions. Great. What is the state doing right now to combat this problem? Well, childhood obesity is huge. It's very complicated. Um, it's a complex phenomenon. And as I was listening to folks talk earlier, there was a lot about individual behaviors, responsibilities, what can we do as individuals, as parents, as teachers, but there is a larger piece. So what we're doing at the state, we've created the Healthy Kids New Mexico program, which is really trying to target elementary school age children. That's where we know we have the greatest chance to possibly help in shaping behaviors. How do we create healthy schools where the environment really supports healthy eating, active living, whether it's in your cafeteria, whether it's the way you walk or bike to school? Can we open up schoolyards so that they can be used during non-school hours? Can we begin to think about having community gardens or school gardens where children can learn where food comes from? The Cooking with Kids program, um, fabulous. I think a lot of people in this room probably loved everything you just said. <laughs> but, you know, um, so why isn't this the, the situation right now today? I mean, why isn't it all fixed today, right now, if this well, is... Don't we always want the, the easy bullet? Um, there's, it took us a long time to get here. It's going to take us a long time to reverse the trend. I mean, what we've seen is last year for the first time we looked at the obesity prevalence for elementary school age children. 13% of incoming kindergartners were obese across the state. 25% of kindergartners who are from tribal communities who are American Indians, they're obese kindergarten. You're not going to see reverses. I mean, we, we all know how hard it is to lose 5 or 10 pounds. Well, imagine if you have a kindergartner who is obese, what are their chances of reversing that? And then what's incredibly scary is from thir at third grade, they almost double it. We're seeing 22% of third graders who are obese. That suggests to me at the state we need to do something and we need to target elementary school. So, Patty, I wonder, I work with the Healthier Weight Council, as you know, and we're looking at um, licensed uh, license daycare regulations. So before they even get to elementary school, what are they getting in the daycares? Um, and looking at, I know that there's been new um, regulations regarding only serving 100% fruit juice, which is great, but how much are they getting of that a day versus just eating an orange or an apple? So I would hope that you could at some point focus before they get to school also. The new state regulations that came out 
uh, I think it was 2010, say we have to make water readily available in licensed child care centers. That's huge. We need to eliminate sugary beverages and only permit fruit juices, 100% fruit juices, not fruit drinks. Um, they've also included physical activity. So now we have a regulation which says all preschool children who go to licensed daycare centers have to get at least an hour's worth of physical activity. And let's limit how much TV time and video game. That's down to one hour. So it's important to do the eat healthy eating piece, but the physical activity Absolutely. piece is also critical. So New Mexico does not have very strong protection in terms of liability for schools. Is that something that can change and maybe some of the legislat mm -hmm. legislators can speak to that? For I think school? some people might not know that a lot of schools shut the gates after yeah. school and on the weekends and so kids from the neighborhood can't even go play on that playground because the gates are locked and the issue there is schools are afraid of being sued. Exactly. So um, is this something that either of you have looked at in, in terms of limiting liability? Well, I can tell you that at our school, I, I teach these not in high school besides being a, a legislator and we have a very unique agreement. We have a, a joint use agreement with the county. And so we have a community center and a gymnasium that we share with the county. And so that gymnasium is open all the time. Mm -hmm. So students, and we, and, and we just added a, a very nice weight room to that. And so students can go in there for a very limited cost on nights and weekends and, and work out, uh, get on weight machines, get on treadmills and all that. Mm -hmm. I, I think that would be a great idea to, to move forward to limit that liability. And, and let the school become a part of the community. Exactly. I know that there's real interest also in seeing that the kitchens might be more available for food processing. So I think that there's uh, ways we can utilize um, different types of facilities without trying to actually spend money on new ones. Um, but it's the joint, joint agreement thing that I think is going to make the difference. So we pay for those facilities, so why are they closed? We just unlock gates, we make them welcoming, we make them safe. I mean, children are on them every day. How do we take those empty school yards and really make them in a cost-effective way active? But how could we also do school gardens? I mean, why can't a school garden become a community garden? Because they get vandalized. That's well, but I mean, again, <laughs> but there are people who have overcome that barrier and said, we're putting in... Um, cameras, for example, Clovis, they have a very creative, they open up their gates, they've got cameras, everyone knows everyone, and if somebody's daughter or son has gone in or a group of them and vandalized something, the principal or whomever is on the phone calling and saying, you need to get them over here and there's community service. So there is accountability. I, there are huge obstacles, but I don't think that should be the reason to stop us from doing it. What I always hear about the school gardens is, we'd love to have a school garden, but who's going to take care of them in the summer? Well, let me think, all the neighbors around the yeah, school, right. perhaps they could help, but, but we have to... We have to think of it differently. We have to frame it differently so it doesn't belong to me in the school or me as a community member. Why are these not all shared community resources? In some ways, we've, we've isolated schools so much because we're so afraid of them being a part of the community, but now we're paying for it. Well, one of the things that, that we recommend, you know, the, the easiest thing when you talk about exercise, so that you don't have to buy a gym membership, you don't have to pay that expense, the biggest thing that I, that I recommend is walking, but it's hard to find safe places to walk. And I, every morning I, I take my dog out and I see the school, I pass the school, and, I, and all of us are walking on the street and we're dodging the cars and I'm worried about I don't wear my headphones because I'm not going to hear that car coming up behind me. And I think, you know, if the school was open and we could loop the school, you know, and, and that kind of thing so that families can go as a family. Uh, and not be afraid that they're going to get hit on the car or if there's not parks by, there's a school there. So the same reason we have out. a program that we offer mm -hmm. that's like eight consecutive weeks, one night a week, and I spend a lot of time looking around for some place to hold this where I have a gym, I have demo kitchens, I have a, a place, and our community centers are busy, but some of them have really active programs and they don't have room for me. So having a place to hold and be able to hold this program repetitively in an environment that lends towards physical activity and kids cooking is something that makes would make a big difference. So what's the solution to the liability order. problem? Is it a piece of legislation or is it individual 
contracts. I think part of it's definitely legislative. I mean, there, there needs to be just stronger protection for schools. But um, I mean, as Carolyn has been talking about, I think you need to lay the community groundwork. I mean, I don't think you can come in and say the school's open, everyone come. Um, you know, I think it's finding out what communities need, and that takes manpower. I mean, it's people going and, um, you know, having meetings and trying to get parents involved, and also making sure, can you pay APD to mm -hmm. be on a school site? You know, I mean. There was a really large push for community schools for a number of years, and, um, and some of that feels like it's really been scaled back, and what we hear is it's because of funding. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there are many issues, and trust, community trust is a big issue too. And some of it is perception. We have three pilots going on right now. But just let's unlock the school gates, mm -hmm. and especially in areas that are low income, that have multiple unit housing, so that there's a safe place for children. And what we found when you look at the studies is the more eyes mm -hmm. on a playground and the more people on a playground, the less vandalism you have. Mm -hmm. Senator McSorley, you know, you're on the Judiciary Committee. What do you think the reception would be in the legislature to uh, a bill that would provide more coverage for community use of schools? Well, I've already seen it because it's already been proposed. What the school systems tell us is, yes, we w want in many cases to be the heart of the neighborhood, but we use the summer to regenerate the grass that's so used all day long by the kids in school. Can you help us? And by help us, can you bear the cost? So it's, if we're going to share this asset, we have to share the cost. And we couldn't find any other entity that could help us pick up those costs. That's where I think the sweetened beverage tax could come in, a proposal to tax uh, sweetened beverages and use that money to, not just to treat the effects of obesity, but for prevention. Well, you want to know how powerful this industry is? Mm -hmm. When I co-sponsored the bill to take off gross receipts on food, we were promised every step of the way that soda would not be included. Sure enough, after the bill was passed, when it went through an administrative procedure, there it was, soda pop was taken out, and now you don't pay gross receipts on soda. Representative, would you have any objection to taxing soda in order to pay for some of this stuff? Uh, would, would I have any objection? I'm not sure. Um, you know, I'd have to think about uh, where the tax dollars would go ex exactly. I mean, you know, we're, we're talking about making the schools a, a, a center of the community, and one thing we're not, I don't think, addressing is that parents have a big part in that. I mean, if you're grand, the schools may not be able to get janitors, they may not get teachers or principals or whatever to do that, but I think the parents could take a, a big part in that. You know, we were talking earlier about uh, reforms of school food that uh, were pushed through in Governor Richardson's uh, administration. Does it need more work? Does it need an update? Well, I think that's what's happening at the federal level. So literally one year ago, the Child Nutrition Reauthorization passed. Uh, it means getting different things on the plate in the school meal program, as we talked about before, or in a change of what that looks like, more fresh fruits and vegetables on the school meal plate, nutrition rules, getting, getting more of what we call competitive foods, being the sodas yeah. or other industry coming in and selling food and competing with the school meal program. Um, and so there's a change there. School meals has been in part a part of that discussion. And so I, I think we're gonna get change. big lobbying group we all need to recognize is the restaurant industry yeah. because this doesn't only apply to schools it also applies to restaurants are restaurants going to put the number of calories and carbohydrates in their supersized meals and the new mexico restaurant industry has also grown a lot on this issue from complete denial 10 years ago and using uh, a new mexico enchilada as an example why we could never do this in new mexico because we'd be anti-New Mexican. But now there's a lot more thought about, well, maybe this enchilada with real beans that's not all pre-processed. All of those things will take a little bit of time and a lot more effort, but it can happen, and especially as the consumers demand more, not only in their schools, but in their restaurants when they go out to eat and in their grocery stores. Like, you know, I was thinking as a kid, I thought I hated pineapple because all we ever got was pineapple in a can. And when 
I had my first pineapple as an adult, fresh pineapple. It was a totally new experience to me. And uh, I think that's what more kids, if they had that new experience, they would go on with pineapple and olives. My daughter was traveling overseas this summer. She's a big fan now of beets because <laughs> in the third world, they eat a lot of beets that are just magnificently prepared. You should see her at home cooking beets. It's like <laughs> the most wonderful thing in the world. What are some of the things that you guys would put on a to-do list to take away from the show today? I had this idea listening to this soda conversation. Teachers are so important to their students and their modeling behavior is so powerful. If teacher unions could make a decision to not have sodas in their teacher lounges, I know it's viewed as a privilege at this point and there um, ha has been bargaining around this, but those teachers are powerful and around the state if they, you know, if they got that idea that we don't want this anymore for ourselves, um, I think that would be, you know, it's a tiny step in a way, but that could have a powerful influence. That's a good one. This show is going to start some fights around the dinner table. <laughs> Andrew? I'd like to expand on that because I've been, I've been uh, looking at the teacher as the all-powerful human being, the higher power that's in that classroom with those 25 to 30 children for, what, six to eight hours a day? And those children see, is Andrew Garrison feeling good? Is Mr. Garrison, does he uh, practice what he preaches? Is he high energy? Does he pay attention to me? Does he have a smile when he, when he sees me? All those little itty-bitty things. If we can develop teachers, and I'm not talking teacher development to give them more stress than they already have about standard-based assessments <laughs> and meeting AYP and No Child Left Behind. I'm talking about revere teachers here in New Mexico, the way they're revered in other countries that are scoring higher on uh, assessments than we are. Give them perks. Uh, work with the gyms that are close by to give them a membership. Uh, give them a, a first class adult nutrition education. We can all learn. I'm going to go find out what kale is after this Cooking meeting. Class. You know, we're just going to learn, learn, learn all the time. I, I'd say the number one thing on my Christmas list would be more play for children. Get up and play hard. Physical um, play, not um, killing right. ninjas. No, play. physical play. Put down the remote of any kind <laughs> and go out and play. Play in your neighborhoods. Play at your schools. Um, we don't need, when, when we talk to kids about getting one hour of physical activity, I don't really picture kids on a treadmill. Uh, I want them out playing, play with each other, play in your neighborhoods, play Plus, hard. Increasing access and opportunities for the kids in the state to be healthy and to recognize that, you know, a huge issue, it's, 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 we have an issue of poverty here in the state. It's very interesting, you know, in San Felipe we built a soccer field and a community park with a walking trail. It was the first recreational facility in that Pueblo's history. And I think that that's not a unique situation here in New Mexico. And I think that we really need to put our heads together and kind of look at all these different communities in, in New Mexico and, and look at where we need to make those investments to create the environments for our people and our children most of all to be healthy. My wish list is the education piece and the education piece for primary care providers. So pediatricians, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, that we're not afraid to broach the subject with our families. There's so many times that we don't want to um, talk about the fact that the child sitting in front of us who's here for a well child visit is very, very overweight, obese. And so it gets glossed over, you don't discuss it. And it's not to say that the parenting is bad, but maybe they don't know, you know, uh, a very simple, um, a simple message that I try to give to my families because we're all pressed for time, we all have to see more patients very quickly, is 5210. Five servings of fruits and vegetables a day. Um, no more than uh, two hours of screen time, if you can, even less. An hour of physical activity of play and zero, zero um, sugary drinks. Go for the water. Even when we talk about having uh, fruit juice in the schools, well, even if it's 100% fruit juice, it's a, lot of calories. it's a lot of calories, and it doesn't have that much. It, 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 it doesn't have, it's, it's, it's still not that good. It's got a color. It's got a color. <laughs> it's got a color. And to get people to know that Gatorade was meant for the Florida Gators, big football players, 
not for children. Not for children. I'd love to see some of our programs not siloed. I mean, I see when we are at the legislature and certainly the work you all have to do there. Um, so we show up to School Nutrition Day. We've got Physical Activity Day. Um, if we could combine and really see ourselves united in these programs so that our kids are getting physical education, they're getting nutrition education, and they're getting the options on the plates that look a little bit different than we have now that really match a healthier diet. Um, but that it's all a, all, all a part of one, and instead of feeling like these are siloed programs from each other. And I see that happening, and I think our state has a lot of opportunity, and we've got some really amazing people doing this work, and, and, and also policymakers who are helping us with it. So I think um, uh, that I would love to see uh, a more united effort when it comes to those um, issues for kids. Well, I had one more. All right. It just speaks to physical education to reform it. So we're not just having a credit requirement for physical mm -hmm. education, but we need to separate physical education from physical activity. Play. It's different. I'm, Play. I'm educating here, and I need to give some history and, and, learn and teach locomotive patterns. Or wait a second, I only have 45 minutes. Let's go hit the track. And so to make it enjoyable and fun and, and the breaks in school when children are sitting in their desk, mm -hmm. do they know how to stretch? Do they know how to increase uh, um, or improve their posture? Do they know, you know what helpful feel-good stretching is to just get, shake it off and then they get back to teaching? Nate? Yeah, my wish list is definitely, and it's related to Kylan's, but it's just partnerships between primary care physicians or primary care providers um, and schools because best case scenario if I have an obese kid I get to see that child four hours a year and that's you know by noon on Monday morning a school has met that so um, I just think those community partnerships have to happen because it is a, it's a really multifaceted difficult problem and it needs to be addressed from a lot of different angles. Representative Smith? We, we were brought up in the 60s we grew up in the 60s and, and John F. Kennedy had a a uh, program back then of physical fitness. Uh, the senator and I both remember the days that we had to do 100 sit-ups. You know, it, it was a challenge back then, and, and I think we challenged our students a lot better. Uh, you know, in the the Eisenhower days, the Kennedy days, uh, and that time. And and from a policy standpoint, I don't know if we could do something about that with the uh, physical activity, the physical education, is uh, to come out with some real guidelines and saying, you know, by the time you're in. Uh, third grade, you ought to be able to do this many pull-ups. If we tested <laughs> them as much on physical fitness as mm -hmm. we did on <laughs> everything else, yes. maybe things or would be different. Education. They don't get tested in elementary school on health education. It's there are standards and benchmarks, and they're very good, but it's not uh, incorporated into many of their their the teachers' curriculum. Hmm. So I want to thank you all very much for being here today and uh, and helping us come up with all of these ideas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. You can get overwhelmed by the fact that how can we ever accomplish this? <laughs> Globally it's hard, but individually we can make a difference one by one. What we're working on next with the New Mexico Food and Agriculture Policy Council is to continue to try and get the state to invest in school meal program, fresh fruits and vegetables, New Mexico grown. We've got a lot to look forward to in the session and beyond. At the legislative level, we need to find more allies, and I'm happy to try to lead that. I love the fact that the uh, legislators came in and uh, gave us that other point of view because as, as, um, in my role on the Public Education Commission, it, it is about compromise. We need to look primarily at those preschool and those elementary school age children and their families. That's the time they're shaping their behaviors. You have to interweave the, the educational piece with all the core subjects, so social studies, math, history, that needs to be a part of it. Science, well, this is science. We need to have some way to hook up all of these programs so that for somebody like me that sees patients, that sees kids, that I can refer them to them, because I didn't know about several of these programs. You can't just give up on those 33% uh, of our kids and just say, we're not going to do something about it. So you have to get passionate about it. You have to get people involved. I think we can really actually prevent obesity, and uh, it might take us a while, but now's the time to do it, and I think we've got the right team. Join us for Public Square on the last Thursday of every month. Our January show will be about the effects of heroin addiction on young people. 
To participate in Public Square and for more information, go to our website, knme.org backslash public square. Here you can give us feedback or suggest topics. Also, look for us on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you for watching.